posting. Live. Yay. <laughs> oh, wow. We have 34 viewers. <laughs> That's awesome. So hi, everyone. Hi. Nicole's going to keep sharing some, some things out. And once she's done sharing things out, I'm going to switch over to doing that. Uh, you have tuned in to the CosmoQuest 24-hour Hangout on Air. Um, apparently, the two of us are moving so fast that we've expanded time. This Hangout is actually going to span 32 hours, starting now, noon Eastern, 9 Pacific, 11 AM here in the Central Time Zones. And we're going to stay here with you. Occasionally, one or the other of us will take naps. One of us will always be with you, we hope, unless like a tornado takes us out. No, um, <laughs> I almost had that two weeks ago. My first Midwest tornado. Yes, oh it, it hit two blocks that way. Oh <laughs> so, um, but but we're here to bring you science, to bring you art, to bring you all the different things that we can bring you, all of it related to astronomy. Our goal this weekend is to raise money to keep our programs alive and keep our programs going. Um, but rather than just spending the entire 32 hours begging for money, don't worry, we will beg. You can donate at cosmoquest.org slash donate. We should have that as our lower third. Okay, I can do that. Okay. Uh, so, um, but, but we're also here to try and engage you. And so we're going to be doing a variety of different interactive activities. Uh, we are going to be doing um, some Twitter contests when we have Sir Amy on later. And the winter, winners of those Twitter contests will be getting Surly Amy's, not like the one I'm wearing. This is not actually Surly Amy. No. Just Surly's. <laughs> Surly's, yes. We, yes. Can't, we cannot give away Amy. <laughs> we'll be giving away Surly's, the jewelry. Um, but uh, then we also are going to be playing a game during the last hour of the show, and this game is going to be created by you. So tomorrow, when the two of us are our most sleep deprived, <laughs> And uh, we're, we will drag in other members of the team. We'll have Joe and Corey, our programmers here. We're going to probably uh, drag in Tim uh, LeGlauer, who's close. Yeah, I can't say his name, um, <laughs> who's going to be running our shop this weekend. And we're going to be playing a game of Cards Against Astronomy. Um, now, this is something all of you can participate in. If you go to the Cards Against Humanity website, they have free templates there. You can either download the templates or just look at how the game is played. And we're going to ask you to send us white cards and black cards. And the way you're going to do this is post them up on Google+. Use the hashtag card against, cards against astronomy and the hashtag hangoutathon, which is the hashtag. Hash this is on Google+. Oh, though. OK, OK. On Google+. <laughs> So on Google Plus, use the hashtags Cards Against Astronomy, Hangoutathon, and then tell us if it's a black card or a white card. And we will work on putting those cards together and playing the game live with you. Now, if you are more of a Twitter person, I get that. I'm a Twitter person myself. Um, then you have fewer characters. So uh, do Cards Against Astro and a B or a W for black versus white, and we will try and sort what we can. Yeah, sounds good. So we are almost all shared. So I am setting up comment tracker so that you can talk to us. Um, there are several ways you can do that. So you can use the hashtag Hangoutathon on Google Plus or on Twitter. Um, if you are on the event pages right now, um, we have a main event page and a part one event page. We're watching the comments from there. You probably already saw my test comment. Um, uh, if you have found it on my stream on Google+, uh, you can comment there, and I'll try and track all the shares from there as well. Oh, and on YouTube, of course. If you're watching on YouTube, we're tracking those comments, too. So uh, say hello. And uh, as you may have noticed, I'm wearing this strange device on my head. Um, this is Google Glass. And uh, Nicole has one on her head as well right now. And I think we both have our notifications set up so that you can send us questions during this Hangout-a-thon directly to our Google Glass using Twitter. So if you tag us uh, by, my name is at Starstrider, uh, Nicole is at Noisy Astronomer, um, the notifications will go to our heads. We will hear little bings. So my I just- My mother loves this feature, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I just got an email message. 
and uh, you will be able to see us reading without having to, to turn away from the camera. Uh, this is another way that you can interact with us during this event. Um, and I need to give a shout out to one of the most important people for this weekend, the coffee. My husband's important too. That's a different one. Oh. That's mine. Okay. Where's the coffee? It's on your desk. It's on my <laughs> desk. Okay. <laughs> this is good coffee too, but this is I bought from another fundraiser. Uh, do you think she... Okay. <laughs> there it is. That's the one that we, we okay. got sent. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. So due to confusion, I'm not currently drinking the right coffee. That will get fixed. <laughs> we haven't um, ground this one yet. I'm excited. For okay. That. So we have a coffee grounder downstairs. We have buttons. He sent buttons. I feel... <laughs> Ooh, magnets too. Okay, sorry, I'm getting distracted by the shinies. Uh, so this came to us, and I'm going to mispronounce the last name. It, they came from Steve, and Steve's last name is uh, Tru Truglio, Steve Truglio. He does my show with UC Steve at... Um, at speaker Sprecker, S P R E A K E R dot com. He is by day someone who does his own coffee roasting. Mm. And he sent us coffee that we shall be consuming to keep us awake for the 32 hours of this 24 hour hangout. <laughs> I'm just going to keep enjoying saying that. I love it. I just sent you the comment tracker link. Oh, um, wow. If okay. any of you can help out a guy who's on the YouTube, um, some people are seeing unsupported video format in the Android YouTube app. If someone can comment back to try uh, restarting or updating their version of Android. We had some problems with people yesterday. Who couldn't okay. Get it. But the YouTube work link should work for mobile and everybody. So, yay. <laughs> okay. Wow. <laughs> Hi, Andy. It's great to see you from the UK as well. Um, this is great to see everyone here. So, uh, Guido Bibra, you are in just the right place to be leaving your comments. Um, so, we are all set up, I think. I think. Have you introduced Chuck yet? I have not. This is Captain Chuck. Uh, well, later on, we'll have a segment where we hear more about the, the origins of Chuck the Squirrel. Yes. Uh, which is a, uh, a My Moon mascot. We have our own little version. This is Captain Chuck McFlufferbutter. <laughs> I love uh, that name. That, that my friend Gail <laughs> named that. Uh, and then, but he's got a Twitter handle at Captain Chuck Squirrel. Kind of spelled funny. Squirrel. Um, don't worry about it. He'll tweet at you. I'm sure. <laughs> so, so to to answer a few questions that I know will come at some point about the setup that we have here. Um, We're in Pamela's attic. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to my rec room. Um, so, so the reason that you see us on this very awkward dorm style futon is because the stairwell to get to the attic is 21 inches wide. <laughs> so the only way to get things into the attic is they have to be built up here. Um, so we uh, had to construct our entire set quite literally out of pieces that would fit through a door only 21 inches wide. And uh, so this is the futon. This is the pile of, we created our own newscaster desk out of the cube ottomans you can get at Target. Um, and then we needed to solve some basic problems like, oh dear, there's two of us. We need microphones. And back in the early days of Astronomy Cast, our awesome listeners, um, hopefully some of you are Astronomy Cast listeners, donated money that allowed us to buy this microphone setup. So this is one of the original setups that Fraser and I had for when we actually met for the very first time down in Austin, Texas at a meeting of the AAS. Oh, that must have been fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, we also stole ruthlessly mic stands from my husband. Uh, we have lights that uh, came from people who donated to Astrosphere New Media. And um, then we had to problem solve all of the various how do we go live for this long issues. Um, so we are using a hard-lined Ethernet cable that is running up from the basement through the 
place where the water pipe is, of all things, through the center of my house. So there had to be a cable dropped all the way to the basement where the router is. But at least Joe didn't have to pull out a drill. That's he true. At midnight last night, we're like, we need Ethernet. And one of, our, one of the Cosmo Quest programmers goes, give me a drill. Yeah, we're, we're ready to go through the floor to the level. So we're directly above my house's server room. I'm the type of nerd that our house has a server room. Um, and, and then we had to solve basic problems like, oh, crud, we know both of our Google Glass will at some point run out of battery. And he dropped off the camera, but we have... There's a little bear. This, oh. I just dropped the turtle, I think. This is the bear of charging. The bear of power. There is actually a power cord that will run up on the bear. Oh, that's crooked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we've learned that the bear has exactly the right sized head to put Google Glass on him to charge Google Glass. So um, we've had to solve many different problems. And now we're here for you. We, um, we got a hi from Paul Stewart on Twitter. Uh, and good luck. And uh, Tree Lobsters uh, just wants a heads up. Comment Tracker's been acting funny with tr Twitter lately. Uh, it's been acting funny with lots of things for me. So <laughs> we will do the best we can at tracking. Uh, we don't have Cheetos, but we do have coffee coming. Hi, Bethlehem, Todd and Bethlehem. Uh, say hi to, to George, George Rob for us because he couldn't make it. <laughs> yeah, and we, we may have hoping. ice cream later, Michael. I think Don has promised to bring over some ice cream. Really? Very toppings. Okay. <laughs> so we'll see. That's, that's awesome. Um, so I guess here's the, the intro. Yeah. Yeah, here's the intro. And um, besides that, all the places that you can get in, in touch with us. We want to hear from you throughout the weekend. Uh, we, we have all the things open on multiple devices. And we hope to be bringing you a really exciting lineup of guests. If you want to see who all is going to be here, um, you can go to CosmoQuest.org. And there is a blue box that has a schedule button in it. And you can see that our first big guest is going to be the Jungle Fire. Uh, they're coming on at 12.15 Central Time. That's 10.15 Pacific, 1.15 Eastern. Forgive me for only giving U.S. time zones. So they're the ones I can do in my head quickly. Timeanddate.com is my best friend when doing international telecoms. Yes. So use that website to, to translate if needed. So the, the Jungle Fire should be setting up sometime during the, the next segment. They're here. Oh, up. <laughs> oh, awesome. They got here quietly. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, <laughs> I so got a message from Tim. We, we have a second set set up down on the first floor of the house, which is also the dog zone. So we, we will... really sick last night. <laughs> we, we will enter the dog zone. Um, and there, I love this combination. They're a secular soul band. They uh, do science-inspired music in the soul genre of music. And we're really excited that they could... I will probably abandon the set to go dance. <laughs> That's okay. I'm good with that. I'm good with that. Um, they didn't bring the whole band, but we're going to sit down. We're going to talk. They, their guitar, lead guitarist, their singer, I think their band manager are all going to be here. Um, and then 115, we have uh, Amy Davis Roth of Surly Ramix. We said we can give her to a good home only. <laughs> so we are allowed so, to give away well, Amy. Well, no, we can claim her. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think that works that way, right? <laughs> So, um, yeah, that's, that's our goal. And we are trying to raise $200,000 this weekend. And uh, that is a very weighty goal to try and raise. It's, it's an intimidating goal to raise. Um, if, if you go to our contribute page, you can actually see how far we've made it along that list. So far, we've raised $741. Um, so we've only gotten yeah, a very... before we went live. Yeah, that's, so that's true. That's good. true. <laughs> now, if this number is too big, well, that's for you to decide. It's, it's up to you to decide if what we're doing is worth it. Um, we're trying to raise this money because that's enough funding to pay Nicole, myself, Joe and Corey, our programmers, our education team, Georgia, um, Ellen and Kathy. Um, it pays our business manager, Anne. That's enough funding to keep all of us going for six months. That's enough funding for us to launch an entire new citizen science program. We have one already laid out. Um, we actually have two already laid out, so if we overshoot our goal, um, we have people that 
want to help us explore the sky and the radio, who want to help us. <laughs> you guys know how I feel about this, right? I'm so right. excited. It's a radio, low frequency radio astronomy project. And um, and when, when we designed everything that we're doing, our goal wasn't to have to beg you guys for money, but we're at this awkward point where the U.S. government is, is undergoing sequestration, which is a U.S. word for saying austerity. It's really the same thing. Um, and, and they're also cutting funding in a variety of different places in some of the proposed budgets. And those funding cuts, those funding um, changes are already starting to hit. And grants that we would normally count on being able to get no big deal um, are now not even going out so um, we're I trying started a couple proposals and then the call got pulled or yeah yeah so, yeah it's a little tough and <laughs> and if you go to cosmoquest.org um, on our background page we have links to all the different things describing what we're facing but at the end of the day we're not here to beg you for money we're here to do science. And so we're going to spend the next 45 minutes talking to you about what citizen science is um, and, and why we would engage in it. And uh, so I, I think this would be a great place to introduce the, the radio project sure. that you want to do. because um, First, I want to answer a couple of questions. Uh, we, the entire session is being recorded. So as they go up on YouTube, YouTube will save the recordings. And so yes, you can come back and visit this program anytime. And, and Nathan, who is our fabulous uh, YouTube editor for Astrosphere New Media, uh, CosmoQuest is a joint production of Southern Illinois University Edwardsville and Astrosphere New Media for the building of the things. And then we have dozens of other partners. So Nate over at Astrosphere, he will edit this into individual segments so you can get the segment you Sweet. want. Uh, and Graham Stickings wants to ask, uh, are you only geared up for donations from the US? No, we can take, it's, it's PayPal. We take donations from anywhere in the world. The only time we show bias between continents is when we are going to mail you things. Yes. <laughs> so if you go to astrogear.org, we have t-shirts available. Um, and if you're international, we're going to hit you with a large international fee to play, pay for the flat rate box. Yeah, so Astro Gear Store is up with all the merchandise in it. That was something my boyfriend and Tim put together last night. Yeah, <laughs> so. and we'll be shipping things out as you make orders today. Yep. Uh, and later on, I think we've got a couple questions about Google Glass itself, so maybe we can take one of the 15-minute yeah. segments to actually talk about that later okay, on. Okay, that So we will, we will talk about the Google Glass experience, the few days that we've had it, uh, yeah. later on in the show. So. Right, so these, these are completely new devices to both of us. <laughs> um, do we have other questions? That's what I saw so far. And yes, we look a bit boardish. <laughs> we have a lot of hellos, and I want to individually say hello to everyone, but that will take up another entire segment. So okay. yeah, let's go. Okay, on. so so citizen science, what is it? That's probably the best place to start. Um, it's the simple act of someone doing science when it's not their paid profession. It could be a matter of going outside and. Uh, someone, I'm getting breaking news, okay. Uh, it could be a matter of somebody going outside, looking up and noticing, well, a supernovae, a star that isn't normally there. Now, if you go out and notice the supernova and the only thing you do is go inside and tell your cat, that's not doing citizen science. If you go outside and you look at the Big bit. The, and you look at the Big Dipper, and you know how the Big Dipper normally looks, and you suddenly see that there's this extra star in the middle of the pot of the Big, big Dipper, and you go inside and you share what you've discovered. That's doing citizen science. It's making an observation, documenting the, the, the observation, and reporting the observation. And sometime, sometimes it's making actual measurements, going outside, looking up, going outside, uh, watching bumblebees go to flowers. There's citizen science projects that are studying where bees, what pollinating bugs are out there. Um, it yeah, can I'm also be... Maple, there are maple tree farmers who have been taking uh, extra logs of their, um, the historical logs of, of the trees and then actually adding in more observations, reporting back to scientists and developing these huge logs that are looking at climate change just from the effect on maple trees. And when she says logs, she doesn't mean logs from the tree. She means <laughs> observation logs. Observation, yes. I'd love to, to be a scientist who had to mail wood. 
Um, that would just be wrong. Um, so, so citizen science engages everyday people in helping us do science in a lot of cases we couldn't otherwise do because it requires too many eyes on the sky, too many eyes on the data, too many people outside observing what's in their yard or in their neighborhood. And by getting your help, we can do things we would never otherwise be able to do. And the, the radio science project that we want to do is an example of science folks are desperate to do, and they can't. Yeah, so there's uh, the, the Long Wavelength Array is a radio telescope out in New Mexico, out, uh, started out at the VLA site, a very large array. Uh, and it's these spidery dipole looking things because they work at really low radio frequencies. What does a dipole look like? It's. I, <laughs> <laughs> I want to show you one. Uh, just imagine the, these metal bars coming down from a central point, right? And that is what you need to collect long wavelength radio waves. And when I say long wavelength, um, I don't mean long wavelength if you're a ham radio operator. I mean if you're a radio astronomer. Um, it's down below the FM band. Um, and uh, they're looking at the entire sky and they're making these images every few minutes of the entire sky. Um, and the brightest thing you see is the Milky Way, right? And then there's a few, uh, a few other, the sun, eh, it's there. It's a lot dimmer than the rest of the Milky Way. Um, you have uh, certain radio galaxies and supernova remnants that are really bright. Jupiter's really bright. But there are other things that are happening and going on and getting bright in the sky, these transient events, these things that change with time. Um, but with all this data that they're collecting, they have, I think, one grad student who's been trying to keep up with looking for all the transients and, and uh, doing the source selection. And so they actually need help looking through the data uh, and finding these, these new sources of transient events. They could be things like um, uh, neutron stars uh, colliding, uh, major, majorly energetic events going on in the universe. How awesome would it be to just log in to the computer in the morning, eat your breakfast, and do some citizen science that allows you to find neutron stars colliding. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. <laughs> and plus, I love that it's this, it's this invisible light, right? It's this uh, seeing the universe the way we don't usually see it, the way we, that you know, Hubble can't see, your eyes can't see, your backyard telescope can't see. It's using this type of light that you've got to build another type of, of uh, telescope to detect. Oh, okay, thanks. we're getting sound. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. You can move your mic so that you can still... I know. Oh, you have to move your coffee. Yeah, that, that's part of the problem. Okay, now I'm officially trapped. There we go. Radio astronomy. <laughs> awesome. So that's <laughs> that's the project that we'd like to get started. Uh, we need to pay and feed our programmers to get the project started as well. Right. Um, so, yeah. So, but, but this is a case where... They, they can keep the data for, what, two weeks, three weeks, Month. they said? Um, so the raw data uh, is, there's so much of it. The files are so large. Uh, we're talking probably a, on the scale of terabytes. Uh, that's what we were getting when I was a grad student working on a similar project. Um, and they have to dump the raw files and save the images, but we want to get to those weird events before the raw data gets dumped so we can save that little chunk of data and, uh, and take a look at it. So, so this is one of those cases where due to lack of funding, due to lack of human resources, due to lack of hard drive space, and really the hard drive space and human resource problems are both lack of funding problems. There's this awesome opportunity to do science mm -hmm. and it's not getting done. And not only is it not getting done, but we can't go back and do it later because the, the data is getting thrown out. And we can save our science through citizen science. We, we can build a way that you can be part of going in, looking at this data, plowing through it in that three-week span, four-week span, before the data gets thrown out. We can find all the amazing things waiting to be discovered. And, and this is just a great opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, this is another case in which your human brain uh, is, does a better job than the automated algorithms that are being built to try and find these point sources. Um, same thing is happening with our mappers projects, uh, trying to find these craters. The algorithms only do so well. It's the human eye brain combination that uh, does make sure you pick up everything that could be there. And, and so this is one of the reasons for why citizen science. This, this is something that we get asked all the time is why don't we just program computers to figure all of this stuff out? Well, we would if we could. Computers, 
they're nice, systematic, they get things done, you can count on them when the software works. The is issue is you are in some cases dealing with data that our software is just not at the point that it can work well. And finding craters is one of those problems. If you go out and you look at the moon, and there's a crescent moon up tonight, so you can go look at the crescent moon, um, you'll see that its coloration varies. It has pale lunar highlands. It has the dark lava seas, the mare. And craters that are in these two different surface types, they look different. Uh, there's also this annoying problem known as the moon moves. So the angle of the sun in the lunar sky is constantly changing. This means that sometimes you have the sun straight overhead, which makes it very hard to find craters because they don't have any shadows denoting where the rims are. Sometimes you have the sun over all the way on the horizon and you have these long, dark shadows. Uh, sometimes you're lucky and the sun's in between. That's the perfect time for finding craters when the sun's about 70 degrees down in the sky. All of these different sun variations make the craters look different. So when you're trying to look at image-based data where the soil can be different colors, where the sun angle can vary, trying to write software that will consistently find all the craters in all these different situations we run into the problem that the software, the best software, is only 70 to 80 percent accurate in the conditions it's programmed for. Whereas the human beings we're finding are 90 percent accurate. And the differences from one human being to another are more related to psychology than anything else. And if you get a group of humans together, like we do with moon mappers and asteroid mappers and mercury mappers over on CosmoQuest, um, those human beings are getting accurate results. And we're actually going to have our two lunar scientists that head up moon mappers come on later in this program. Uh, that's uh, Stuart Robbins and Irene Antonenko. Uh, the two of them just finished this giant paper along with, it, there's 11 authors on this paper. Corey and I are the last two, I think. Um, there's this mammoth paper goes through and asks eight different professional crater markers, uh, people who go out and study cratering on rocky bodies for a living, um, ask them to mark all of the craters in a region, then we have our moon mappers do the same thing, and the results are comparable. So this works. Do we have more questions coming in? I oh, just a couple of other back. things. Um, somebody posted a link to a picture of what a dipole is. Uh, of course, uh, YouTube comments doesn't like links all that well. But uh, if you Google essential radio astronomy, that will take you to the notes for the radio astronomy course I took as a grad student um, from um, a couple of guys at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. And in there, you will find all pictures of pictures of all kinds of radio telescopes, from dishes to dipoles. Uh, so check that out. So thank you, Mr. Magard, uh, for that. Yeah. Okay. I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. That's cool. Um, so citizen science has a long history, especially in astronomy. Uh, when was the first time you ever heard about citizen science? Um, I was in grad school, and I think uh, the, the uh, Galaxy Zoo project was starting. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> we all had a little bit of a laugh because uh, we had just done a, a homework assignment as grad students where we were classifying galaxies. And it was really, you know, it was like our homework. We had to do it and, you know, go back to all the old catalogs and get the right shape and do all this. We're like, they have people doing this for fun. Yeah. Oh my gosh, this is cool. <laughs> it's so great to, to see that people want to help out with research and, um, and put in the time to, to help make those discoveries uh, when we were, you know, ungratefully grumbling about it <laughs> when it was our homework assignment. <laughs> and yeah, so one, one of the research findings that's coming out of this is if you go to something like Mechanical Turk and you pay people to do tasks and you just pay them like a quarter an image or something like that, they'll be embittered, resentful individuals at a certain level. That's overstating it. They won't be enthusiastic. But if you ask people as volunteers to please help, then it becomes something that you're doing for the joy of it. 
And, and so we try very hard when we design citizen science projects to make sure that we leave space for the joy, the pleasure, the enjoyment, the building of community, the doing science and feeling like you're accomplishing something great with what you're doing. Um, we're going to be launching a whole new version of our website in the middle of the night tonight. We're going to have Corey and Joe on, our two lead programmers, uh, to discuss exactly what all is going into the new software. Um, but we're reintroducing a new and improved version of our galleries that will allow you to see how your markings rank up with other people's and see how together we're able to accurately map things out. Um, so yeah, that was really awesome that Galaxy Zoo was one of the first to really hit the mainstream media. It wasn't the first one. Stardust at Home was one of the first online citizen science programs. But citizen science itself has been around for a long time. I, I'm guessing you've heard of William Herschel. Yeah, I think I have. <laughs> yeah. Dude, originally from Germany, yeah. ended up in England. He, he discovered a few things. A few, few things, yeah. Uranus. Well, you know who my favorite scientist, That's citizen true. scientist is. Uh, when you when you think about the history of citizen science, my favorite citizen scientist is Grote Reber. Uh, if you haven't heard of this guy, he is the second guy to ever do radio astronomy. Uh, radio waves from space were detected by Carl Jansky in 1933. Uh, completely serendipitously working for Bell Labs, um, tracking down sources of static on intercontinental phone transmissions. Uh, and he discovered uh, lightning, uh, another lightning, <laughs> and uh, the center of the galaxy because he put together that uh, the 23 hour, 56 minute um, you know, time period of, of the, uh, the signal he was seeing must have been coming from space. Uh, although uh, astronomers didn't really pick up on this. They just kind of, you know, it was in the New York Times, it was a thing, but they didn't really pursue it until this uh, young engineer, Grote Reber, up in Wheaton, Illinois, decided uh, he had pretty much done everything a ham radio operator could do. <laughs> he had contacted everybody. <laughs> um, and As when one he, does. Yeah. And, and, uh, as uh, he heard about Jansky's discovery, he said, oh, I could do that. And so uh, in his spare time with some friends, he built a radio dish in the field near, uh, I think owned by his mom, his mother's house. So across the street from his mother's house. And, um, Whoa, oh, sorry. I'm I, I <laughs> so I'm am explain. having, wow, I just did something really, I now have all the audio. <laughs> Something's playing. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, so we built this this huge dish um, to start tracking the um, uh, radio waves. And so in his spare time, so basically he was working his job as an electrical engineer during the day, and at night he was scanning the skies. Uh, and the frequency band that he started with, he didn't detect anything, uh, thinking it acted like, you know, the light from the sun does. It goes up as you get to higher frequencies um, of like black body radiation. Uh, turned out that wasn't the case, so he dialed back and dialed back and dialed back to lower frequencies until he rediscovered what Jansky had seen. And then he went uh, set aside to make the first map of the galaxy and the radio waves in his spare time. Um, so one of the editors from the astronomical journal that he submitted to um, sent to, had to send a team to his house to inspect what was going on because they uh, they couldn't find a hole in it but it was so incredible uh, what he had done uh, but they ended up publishing him in several astronomical journals and so yeah the fact that he he did all that in his spare time on his own was uh, pretty incredible so that's why he's my favorite citizen scientist um, and you can go to Green Bank West Virginia and see his dish that he used uh, today they've repainted it and restored it and put it up um, right in front of the visitor center. And uh, the reason my head just suddenly went over to the computer over here is uh, I saw that we had a troll reported over on YouTube. Oh, thanks, um, guys. So, so when there are trolls, um, we don't have an easy way because of the way YouTube works to eject the trolls. Um, but if you flag them, report them, uh, do your bit not to feed them. Never feed a troll simply report them and they will be forced to go away by the powers that control the YouTubes. Um, so yeah, Greta Reba, it, it was really just kind of awesome. I and mean, can you imagine the conversation that must have gone on at, at the Astrophysical Journal of the, this dude's a radio engineer and not the science type. This looks good. But radio it, waves from space, like what? yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, 
It's that, interesting, that, that, and that's continued in the history of radio astronomy. You have people coming from the engineering background, people coming from the astronomy background, and, and seeing them work together is really fun and interesting. <laughs> and, and it's one of the few places where there's clearly this partnership between the engineers and the scientists mm -hmm. because it's recognized. Um, this is one of those times where we really need the, electronical engineer, the oh, electrical yes. engineers who, who can, they know this stuff inside out. You and I can use soldering irons. You and I can use it. <laughs> every, every amplifier I tried to make. Okay, so maybe I should be the one doing the soldering. Um, yeah, I, I can't make tiny things. I can okay. make big things. I can make tiny things. <laughs> um, I don't like lifting the big things, so I don't tend to make them. Um, but uh, so this this is this great partnership that arose from someone who, through his day day job, through his regular everyday profession had all the skills and he developed the astronomy knowledge through his hobby and ended up doing amazing things and William Herschel who I started with and we never really told the punchline on that no, one what was it so so William Herschel this is this is a man he was an oboist I always remember that because I played oboe uh, he was a concert director he uh, he was a musician in every professional way but one day he had a friend give him an astronomy book. You've got to read this. And then he had another friend in invite him to come look through his handmade telescope. And Herschel decided to get in on the building telescopes hobby, just like some of you may have done at some point. I know in Boston there's an amazing uh, club for people, the Amateur Telescope Makers Club. And he built what turned out to be one of the best telescopes of his day. And he'd go outside at night and uh, by eye hop from star to star to see what he could find. And what he discovered was between the known stars were a whole lot of objects that no one had ever been able to see before because their telescopes just weren't as good as his. And he and his sister Caroline, who ended up helping him a few few years after he got started, the two of them were responsible for discovering a lot of the objects that formed the basis for the new galactic catalog, new general catalog of astronomy. New, yeah, new, <laughs> new general. at the time, right? And uh, they they discovered um, the Saturn Nebula, uh, the the planet Uranus, uh, just dozens of of um, comets and asteroids, all of these different objects that helped us really start redefining what was in the sky and understanding it a little bit better. Um, so these are people that able, were able to transform their careers in some way into being research astronomers. But the American Association of, Association of Variable Star Observers, founded in 1911, it came along and helped herd the astronomers together, uh, the astronomy hobbyists together to study variable stars. The Center for Backyard Astrophysics today studies cataclysmic variables. Uh, there are hundreds of amateurs who work with the Minor Planet Center to document asteroids. There's all the different supernovae programs that are out there. Mm -hmm. Um, I could go on and on, and um, it's it's just been a really great ride to see what we're capable of when we all work together. Yeah, uh, I got a comment from Graham saying he made a small donation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, he said you wish you could have donated more. What you can do is share what we're yeah. doing. That that helps too. Um, it, you know, in addition to donations or instead of donations. Uh, share the broadcast, share CosmoQuest, uh, do all that stuff. And do science. I mean, that, that at the Marks end of craters. the day, that, that's, that's why we do what we do, is we want to build a community of people who are learning and doing science together, who are watching Hangouts like this and learning what is citizen science, who uh, are, are learning uh, during our learning space every Wednesday. We talk about different educational activities that are available. Friday during our weekly space Hangout, we talk about all of the news. Uh, we have astronomy cast on Mondays, which talks about the um, different core concepts behind many different things in astronomy and physics. Tuesdays, we work to bring you updates from various NASA missions. Learn. Come to us and learn. Become a more scientifically literate society. Um, and when I say society, I mean humankind, not just in, in England, where I believe Graham is, not just here in the U.S., um, but all around the world. I saw that we had someone logged in from the Philippines earlier. That's awesome. One of our buddies from Cape Town. Hi. Hi. <laughs> we both love Cape Town. Um, yeah, and, and so if you can't donate money, what we really want is, is 
you to be part of our community. Go on the forums, introduce yourself, and meet new people, and uh, nurture each other, mentor each other as you work on doing and learning science together. And that's what we're all about. Graham also mentioned uh, gamma ray bursts as yes. a serendipity. I don't know if it's citizen science, if it was discovered by a military satellite. Yeah, so the, the story Close. the story <laughs> on gamma ray bursts, uh, the I believe this was back in the 1960s, um, we had a atmospheric test ban treaty passed between uh, the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and I believe several other nations or, or the U.N. were signed on. I'm a little fuzzy on that part, but a, a nuclear test, atmospheric nuclear test ban treaty went into effect saying no one should test nuclear bombs above the surface of the Earth anymore. This is good. We don't need more radiation in our atmosphere. Um, actually, all of the nuclear bombs that have gone off have made some research very difficult because it means that uh, steel that is made uh, in the modern era is, is all laced with radioactive properties and, and it leaks radiation when you're trying to use it in experiments. So if you're building um, equipment, you have to find pre-modern era steel to use in building your equipment and that's kind of squirrely. Um, so uh, nuclear test ban treaty went into effect. Uh, U.S. wanted to monitor the Soviets, make sure that they actually abided by this treaty. There were a set of satellites launched that could detect gamma rays, um, and sure enough, they detected gamma rays, and, and they were luckily able to determine that the gamma rays weren't from the surface of the planet, because um, if they were from the surface of the planet, bad things might have happened. Um, but then they were left with this perplexing question of what the heck is giving off all of these gamma rays? And over the decades, we were able to figure out that the sources are randomly scattered throughout the entire sky, which means they're not in the disk of the galaxy. And finally, just within the past few tens of years, we were able to get spectra. Uh, we were able to look at the light, spread it out sufficiently that we could see individual lines in the light that would allow us to tell how fast the object was moving um, relative to the Earth assume that the motion is caused by the expansion of the universe and we realize these things are at vast differences distances which correspond to being significant fractions of the age of the universe away so the light has been traveling for significant fractions of how long the universe has existed now since then um, since we figured out where they are when they are what they are um, when they go off they, they have these bright optical flashes in many cases. And there's been cases of amateur astronomers going out and helping us track these bright flashes in the optical light after the gamma rays have been detected. So the satellites will detect the gamma ray burst. Uh, information is sent to cell phones, or it used to be back in the day, pagers. The amateur astronomers get their telescopes on target, start taking images. Uh, there's uh, work negotiating to get the big professional telescopes on target. And it is this um, community of people, the people who operate the satellites, the amateurs who operate their optical telescopes, and the professionals with the bigger optical telescopes that allow us to know when they go off, figure out how bright they started, and then measure how quickly they fade away. Kind of cool. Good stuff. Good stuff. Oh, <clears throat> we have a question. Where is your donate click on this page? Is it there? See the link? Yeah. <laughs> um, I've added it. Yeah. CosmoQuest.org slash donate. Um, that's the donate link uh, for those of you asking. And uh, I've put it in the event page, but we can't edit the YouTube video while it's running. So it's on the screen. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Yeah, it's uh, CosmoQuest.org. Does lowercase d work? I have to admit, I haven't tried lowercase d. Oops. Did I change that? Hi, um, William. I will see you at Skeptics Under the Stars at the end of July. Uh, so, yay, you're bringing a six-inch Lestron. Awesome. Uh, that's an event I'm doing uh, with Women Thinking at the end of July in the Chicago area, actually going up to camp in Wisconsin. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. We uh, have made more than 1% of our goal. We're at $2,336. Wow, awesome. <laughs> that. Yes, and the lowercase d totally works. All right, cool. So there you go. <laughs> Cosmoquest.org slash donate. That's where you can donate uh, all throughout the program and all the time as well, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so we're, our, yes, thank you. Sweet. Wow. You made me incoherent. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard to do. She's a very coherent woman. <laughs> Squirrel. <laughs> 
if we're this silly in hour one, imagine what's going to happen well, later tonight. So I don't know about you, but I'm still kind of pre-coffee at this stage. Yeah, that's true. There's there's our little donate temperature thingy. Um, so there's our goal. There's where you guys have gotten us to 1%. Uh, so this is CosmoQuest.org. Just click uh, background on that blue bar, and that'll get you to this screen, which gets you to the link where you can get to the show or and the donate. Or you can just hit, hit contribute in the blue bar. Yes. Because contribute is just another word for donate. Donate. Contribute. <gasps> We're using synonyms. <laughs> Use your <laughs> words. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Uh, we, got a qu we had a question a little earlier on. I wasn't sure where to fit that in, but it was about... Um, can if we look for if if the light from our galaxy can be bent some way around so that we can see the light from our own galaxy, it has to do with the topography it's of the universe. Why? Okay, so so from our own galaxy, if if there was something gravitationally able to bend the light back to us, uh, it would probably be destroying us okay, quite yeah. actively. Ju so. Yes, Julio says since light takes time to travel, can we ever look back at our own galaxy in a spot we were at millions of years ago? And I think somebody uh, started to answer that as well. Uh, because we're moving slower than light, that light would have pff, gone past us. If that makes sense. <laughs> I'm okay, free coffee so, attacking her with cosmology. No, 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 no. I, this, this is, I, apparently, so when I look up, that's me visualizing things in space. That's gotcha. a weird verbal tick I have, or I guess physical no, tick I have. Um, so what you can imagine is our galaxy might have once once been over here, we're now okay, over here. Yeah. When it, the galaxy was over here, it's radiating light in all directions. Could the light that went that direction have wrapped all the way around the hyper toroid that is our universe and come back to hit us um, where we are now? Um, if the universe were tiny, yes. But if it were that tiny, we would have already been able to start seeing points in the mm. cosmic microwave background that were identical. Um, astronomers have been looking very, very hard in the cosmic microwave background, trying to find these, these points that indicate that light has had the ability to wrap around the universe. We haven't found those yet. So if we lived in a tiny universe, what you're asking could have happened but we don't live in that universe. Instead, we live in one that we think that the, the volume of space that we're able to observe, the observable universe, is no more than 4% of the entire universe. And it could be much, 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 much smaller than that. How? <laughs> so that, that's just what we've been able to figure out so far. Cool. Um, and do you have a link or something where someone can find out more about the pre-nuclear age steel? Oh man! For Eric Briggs, I will find that. Okay. If, if you want to go over other questions that are in there, sure. Uh, yeah. So uh, I will remind you guys of how to comment uh, on the YouTube page where this is being broadcast. Now I should note uh, there is a four-hour limit to Hangout. So every four hours we will be restarting the Hangout um, on the CosmoQuest.org page where you go to uh, the main background. Um, there's a one event page there. We will continually update that and embed the YouTube link, the new YouTube link, every four hours in that page. There are some other part two, part three, part four. We'll be using those as well. Um, so use the YouTube comments wherever we're broadcasting live. Uh, both event pages, the main event page and the one that says part one right now, you can leave a comment there. We'll see it. Um, we are trying to track the hashtag Hangoutathon on Twitter and Google+. We're not entirely sure how well that's working, but I do know I can see comments from the event pages, from the YouTube page, uh, from my stream, and uh, most of the people that have shared that out. Thank you. A lot of you have shared this on Google+. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, so those are the places where you can send us comments. Uh, there's a bit of a delay, um, but we are keeping up best as we can. Um, oh, sweet. Nancy Graz has various laptops set up throughout the house and backyard so you can keep up with the show. Yay! That's awesome. So, so going back to the, the question on uh, pre-World War II, pre-nuclear age steel, uh, if you go to the uh, reserve fleet page on Wikipedia, yeah. it has, um, under alternatives, it says steel from pre-nuclear age ships either mothballed or sunk and raised, called low background steel, so you can also click that link, is used in experimental physics when the experiment requires shielding material which is itself 
only extremely weakly radioactive, emitting less than present-day background radiation radiation. Materials which were manufactured after atmospheric nuclear explosions had taken place reflect the higher ambient level of radioactivity that fallout has caused. Cool! Where did you find this out? <laughs> oh, so cool. I... I uh, Free nuclear, there's the link, yeah. Uh, I went to Michigan State as an undergrad and yeah. they have all of the people who study uh, physics uh, experimentally and in high energy where cool. you need non-radioactive <laughs> stuff. So. Yeah, there you go. There's a link uh, on one of the streams. I don't know which color. Free nuclear steel or low background steel on Wikipedia. Um, we have a question from Graham uh, asking, I've heard some astronomers have watched events by watching light reflected off uh, another galaxy, I don't think so, but a dust cloud, yes. And that is something called a light echo. And we should ask Phil Plate about that on his segment because that's what his dissertation was on. Cool. Uh, at least partly because I know he worked, um, he went to University of Virginia, same place I went, uh, just in a different time. So same place, different time. Um, but yeah, a light echo. So if some, something event, some event happens, some nova, some supernova, um, the light from that, so you have the event happen, pew, and the light comes towards us. You're the camera, you're us. Uh, but the light also goes off in all directions and sometimes it can bounce off of a dust cloud that's sitting back here and get reflected and changed a bit and then we see that a little later on. It's called a light echo and so there are various things that you can learn um, from that. Um, that was something I studied very hard for my qualifying exam. Like <laughs> Gail Zazowski, and I, Gail Zazowski actually led this. She's like, we're going to teach ourselves how light echoes work and do all the geometry and everything. Because oh, there fun. had been a question. It was cool, but there yeah. had been a question on light echoes and every single qual up to that point, going back some number of years, our qual did not have a light echo question. Oh, <laughs> but we Damn. taught ourselves light echo geometry um, anyway. And so that was good stuff. Um, yeah, no, I, I love light echoes because... They, they've allowed us to figure out so many weird things. Uh, during um, the early 2000s, uh, late 1990s, there were a pair of different programs that were trying to find small dark objects within our galaxy that might account for the amount of unobserved matter, dark matter. Uh, this was when we were still trying to figure out what dark matter might be and hadn't settled on it being this crazy non-baryotic, non-collisional stuff that we currently know that it is. Um, people were still looking to see were there lots of rogue stellar mass black holes, were there lots of rogue, very dark white dwarfs, and the way they were looking for these objects was to see if they could watch a field of stars and see one of these dark objects orbit within our Milky Way in front of one of these extremely far away background stars. So they looked at the center of the galaxy, the galactic nuclei, and they looked at the large and small Magellanic clouds, or rather I think only the large Magellanic cloud. Um, as they monitored all of these fields looking for these dark objects to pass in front of a background star, um, they were able to get year after year of images. And as they did this, they found these ghostly streaks in various images and were able to see these ghostly streaks moving over time. And it turned out what they were seeing was the edge-on shell of an expanding, well, ball of light. And this ball had a thickness that corresponded to the duration of a supernova going off. So the supernova goes off and it gives off light for a brief period of time. And it's like firing a laser in a sci-fi movie and seeing that packet of light move through the screen. Well, that doesn't happen in real life. But supernovae give off much bigger packets of light and we are able to see them moving through clouds of dust and gas. And this was actively observed using the MACHO project, which was the project that looked out at the Large Magellanic Cloud. And um, they were able to backtrack this and figure out where different supernovae went off and when they went off. And that was just kind of awesome. And that was another project that engaged amateur astronomers because when they found the, the microlensing events that was a small dark object going in front of a background star, there's a team of amateur observers that helped follow up with all of those observations. So um, taking that back to the idea of <clears throat> citizen science in general, we have a great question from Benjamin Beaumont. Um, sorry, I know, last names, I have We're a long one too. We're just things. We're sorry. So, yeah. Okay. Does citizen science have a stigma within the scientific community because it relies on, oops, <laughs> went down the screen, because it relies on people 
here we go, who wouldn't have completed PhDs or been published? And if so, is this decreasing? <sighs> Crap. <laughs> yeah, <pin things. laughs> okay, oh, good point. What are some of the findings to come out of the projects on CosmoQuest so far? So, in some them. fields, there's absolutely no stigma to using amateurs at all, simply because it, it's been going on for so long. Variable stars, everyone uses the amateur data. You have to. Supernovae discoveries, um, just a whole variety of different tasks where you get people out and helping with the imaging. Um, the amateurs don't always get treated as equals, which is sad. Um, if you go to an asteroid conference, they'll periodically be amateurs presenting their research on measuring the rotation rates of asteroids from looking at how their brightness varies over time. Um, but I'd say that the good people in the field acknowledge the work being done by the amateurs for what it's worth, which is a lot. Um, at the same time, in the newer fields, what we're doing with CosmoQuest, um, we have to go out of our way to statistically prove that this new thing we're doing is actually accurate. Which you'd have to do for any, any new procedure anyway. Yeah. Yeah. You'd have, whether it's, you know, using new people or using a new equipment or a new technique, you'd have to do that. Right. And, and so we're going to have Stuart and Irene on. Um, let me pull up the schedule and I can tell you exactly when we have them on. Um, and they're going to be talking about all of the details to come out of Moon Mappers. And um, so far, what we've determined is one, it works. My God, that was a really, really long paper we wrote. <laughs> um, I, I simply read the thing, um, and reading it took a long, long time. And I read a good chunk of it before I went off to um, the American Astronomical Society meeting last week to make sure I could talk right. about it intelligently. <laughs> um, I'm completely failing to be able to find them in our schedule, and I know this is a personal problem because I know they're here somewhere. <laughs> um, anyways, if you go to our schedule, Stuart and Irene <laughs> are listed on our schedule, and they're going to come and they're going to talk about all of our results. And, and the number one result is yes, it works. Um, statistically, we're finding that the population with moon mappers is equivalent to the population um, of professional astronomers, and that is simply fabulous. Um, beyond that, um, we are also going to um, talk about the different results that we have for the ages. Um, where we've been able to discover... Um, They're at Saturday at 2.15. Thank you. I was just going to scroll up and down. Command F. Times. <laughs> I yes. have the bigger machine. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, she wins. Uh, <laughs> it's your computer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, so at 2.15 today, so that'll be after the band, after Amy, we'll be Stuart and Irene talking about the results of the Citizen Science Project. Right, and, and so they have a bunch of results on being able to determine the ages for various regions. And... I'm just going to let them talk about it. It's, it's interesting results that I will represent very poorly. Um, so do we have any more questions? There are to this science? No. Um, do we want to move to the moon mappers? Yeah. Sorry. So I was, I was figuring we could just demo moon mappers. OK. Um, you want me to screen share? We're still working this out as we go. Um, let me join moon mappers from this computer. OK, cool. I'm going to keep using my join iPad. The, join the Hangout, you mean? Yeah. Okay, good. I'm not sure um, what I actually said. Although, uh, while she's setting that up, I will address two other questions that are, go back to, see, and we're not referring to Richard. I see you texted me the answer over here. Thank you. I'm sorry, Richard. I did not mean to block you. I, apparently, <laughs> I've accidentally blocked him on some network. I will oh, figure no. that out later. So okay, we'll figure I can that out. see you, Richard. Well, we can, I can see it on her screen. So. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Drum is helping us out with the production. He is Richard Drum, the astronomy bum, and is a fabulous uh, astronomer from Charlottesville. Yes. So my old hometown. Um, mm -hmm. I think there was a question about whether we've seen like light echoes that are gravitationally lensed. I would say no, because we see them within our own galaxy, and so they're much closer. Um, and not behind background well, galaxies. So that's actually an interesting question, because... Mm -hmm. The the Vorverps, the oh. light echoes from quasars. Oh yeah. I don't think we found any that have been gravitationally lensed yet, but that opens the potential to find them. Because that's the furthest light echo type thing we've seen. Well, and the right? brightest, brightest 
So yeah, now we haven't found any okay. lensed light echoes yet, but there's the potential. Can you invite me into the hangout? Oh, sure. Invites people. <laughs> I will invite Pamela, who's sitting next to me. <laughs> We're on All different the devices. networks. <laughs> okay, posted. Uh, and then also something that has been bothering me for a while. If gravity is the bending of space time, why are scientists looking for the graviton? So we're particle physicists not looking for the graviton. They're not doing that anymore. No. Okay, particle physicists for a while were had proposed that as a yeah. way of explaining how gravity works. Um, but I don't that, think that's, that's still used. But I think they've figured out that we can't detect the sucker because okay. it's it's um, it has no mass, mm -hmm. and so it you we can't create it in a collider. Okay. So yeah, that would be hard to do. Yeah. Um, yeah um, at one level, you know, particle physicists use particles to explain fields. Right? Gravity is a field. Uh, it is the bending of space-time. It is something so bizarre to our everyday experiences. Like photon of light is both a wave and a particle. Sometimes these things that are just beyond our grasp are, are what our human brains are used to working with. We use different things to describe them, like we'll use a field to describe it, a particle and a wave. But all of those things kind of work together to describe the phenomenon. Uh, I hope I didn't just make no, that way more good. complicated than it needed to be. Um, so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Benjamin just finished his statistics exam and was hoping to never again have to consider significant testing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to try and screen share Moon Mappers. Oh, oh. Somebody from Adelaide, Australia is asking what are the top three things radio astronomers are hoping to find with a square kilometer array. Uh, so the square kilometer array is this massively built telescope, um, which is going to be built partly in Australia, partly in South Africa, um, and it's going to cover several wave bands. The main thing I've heard is to use it to um, map the H1 in galaxies out to significant redshift, so to a larger distance to look at the evolution of, of the H1 in galaxies. Um, the low frequency SKA type things are looking to see, again, neutral hydrogen, but in the very early universe. The hydrogen that filled up the space between galaxies as these first galaxies were forming. So that's another major thing, this epoch of reionization. You need a square kilometer array sized low frequency telescope to map the sucker. Um, there are experiments going on now to make the first detections of it, um, including the paper project, which is one I, I was involved in from, from my uh, PhD, PhD thesis. So mapping H1. The, the neutral hydrogen in galaxies, the different redshifts, and the epoch of reionization are the top two I can come up with off the top of my head. So, thank you for that. Radio astronomy question. Okay, we'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I have to admit, I love having Nicole on our team because I started in radio astronomy. We had the same advisor. <laughs> we did. Hi, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know if you're out there, but Bob Phillips, who used to be up at Haystack Observatory uh, in Westford, Massachusetts, my hometown. Yeah. Um, I worked there in high school. She worked there as an undergrad. That was my first REU project, was working with him and Jody Attridge on the LBA stuff. So. That was my first job. Oh, my God. <laughs> Apes was our first job. So, yeah, yeah, we both started in radio astronomy. She went up to optical. I well, went down to lower frequency. I, I migrated. Okay. My, my uh, dissertation had me all over the wave, uh, wave band. I was using the first in um, NVSS radio data. Oh, and okay. then I was also using x-ray surveys, and then I was taking the optical observations. Right. right. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm a survey kind of girl because the survey data doesn't get rained out. That's nice. Well, it does, but by the time <laughs> I'm getting it, I'm not worried. And uh, thank you, friends of NASA, for uh, giving us your best wishes and, and send it, sharing this around. So. Yeah. And, and looking at our website, it still says live in eight minutes. Can, can you tweet out on CosmoQuest that we're actually sure, live? Sure. Let's do that. I have so, a suite open somewhere. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to big in oh, that window. That window. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There we okay. go. So forgive me uh, for looking over here to the side, but I have my monitor from my other computer over here. This is actually, if, if you were able to, and, and when I stand up, I'll show you the corner. I am five feet away from where I sit when we're recording astronomy cast. So that window that is always in the background when I'm recording, it's right over there. Um, so I, I have that computer um, its monitor is on an arm so that when I'm recording, I can adjust my camera by moving the whole screen around. 
and I just flipped it around for this recording, but that was too much information. Um, so this is Moon Mappers. Um, it's a project that allows you to go in and we have two different tasks. The getting started one, uh, it's going to ask me to log in. It's going to tell me that I don't have my password correct on this computer. This is how you know it's live. Okay, and we are looking at images of the moon from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. This is a spacecraft that is taking the highest resolution images of the moon that have ever been acquired. And were someone taller than me, like my husband, to go lay down on the moon and assume the snow angel position, he'd show up in these images as being a couple pixels in size. We could see Kyle. We could see That's Kyle awesome. on the moon. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Um, so when you're looking at these images, the pixels in some cases are as small as 0.4 meters, so roughly half a meter in size for most of the images. Some of them are at a slightly higher resolution. So half a meter per pixel resolution imagery of the moon. Um, think about Google Maps resolution. We're, we're talking, this is Google Maps of the moon. And these images have so much detail, we can see so many different things in them that if our science team were to try and do all of this on their own, they would never make it to the moon. So we're asking you to go in and mark all of the significantly large craters. And you can tell you're looking at a crater instead of a hill by looking to see where the sun is. And the sun will will shine on the opposite wall of a dip or the front wall, front side of a hill. So I can see these are all dips into the surface of the moon. Some of them are less dramatic. Um, those are ones that have been weathered over time. We don't normally think of the moon as having weather because it doesn't exactly have rain or wind or any of the things that we're used to here on Earth. But there's this constant rain of small meteorites, pea-sized gravel falling from the sky, basically. Um, and it, over the eons, will erase features on the moon. Something else that um, Irene Antonenko does, his research, does her research on is lunar shaking. So over time, the craters actually get erased by large impacts that cause seismic activity. And just it's sort of like tapping the side of a container filled with flour to get the flour to flatten out. Um, that's, we that's, use flour to make craters. Yeah, <laughs> in demos too. It's a good. That's a good. Uh, so I'm I'm gonna hand my trackpad to Nicole, and I'm gonna go help get the band set up. And she's been doing all the tutorial videos. Oh yay! And she's gonna go over all the different tools with sure. you and how they work. And I'm gonna try not to destroy my microphone <laughs> while she extracts herself. I want to say hello to everyone who's listening on Astronomy FM right now. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Michael, for simulcasting on Astronomy FM. Um, if you want to. Uh, see what's going on, follow along with the links in the video of what we're doing as well. Go to CosmoQuest.org. Uh, there's a blue bar across the page. You can see the background of what's going on, the schedule, and the donate link. So uh, we are doing this as a fundraiser. Did you just trip? So no, I'm laughing. So, so I'm going <laughs> to lean forward to my mic. There is a complete carnage of stuffed toys with a <laughs> turtle in the center. I'm going to move the camera for a minute so you can see what I'm laughing at. All of our stuffed animals fell. So, so, yes. Can you see them all now? <laughs> nope, go down more. The bar's in the way. Yeah. This so <laughs> Party the, Spock! Party Spock has abandoned ship. Little face, Will. Face down. Sorry, Will Eaton. And there's just this angry turtle in the center of all of it. <laughs> we had a pretty set, and then we changed it, and now it's all knocked down. Um, okay. do, I have, anyway. do I have it lined back up? Uh, I think so. You can push it up a little. Okay. It's fine. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> all right. So all that good fun stuff. Now I'm going to try and navigate with this trackpad, and I don't know how to click on it. So. Oh. Uh, <laughs> you just just press on yeah. it. Yeah. And I'm taking oh, the coffee beans. All right. She's taking my coffee away. Okay. So <laughs> it smells nice. So now we're at. Uh, so go to CosmoQuest.org. Um, I said that blue bar has all of the uh, show info, but if you go up to Do Science. And then Moon Mappers. Uh, I'm working with Simply Craters. 
and I'm going to show you our interface. Now I have been, as you said, working on the tutorial videos um, for all of the new interface stuff uh, that Corey and Joe have been working on. And these are the highest resolution images of the moon you can see, as she was explaining. Um, and right now I'm using the Mark Creators tool. So it's this button right here, so it's just already clicked. Um, and I'm looking for craters, and what I do is I click in the center of a crater. Now remember, like she was saying, you're looking for where the, there's a light and shadow, um, but you want to get the whole crater in there. So it's a little hard to do from across <laughs> the room. I can click on it. Nope. Click. Nope. I don't like these trackpads. Shh. Ah. I just got it before. Um, yeah, I need a real mouse. This is silly. Uh, <laughs> what you have to do is you click on the center of the crater and drag a circle. Oh, this is frustrating. All right, I'm switching back to my computer. Um, I can do that a little bit easier with a mouse. So I'm on Cosmo Quest. Do science. Let me screen share what's happening here. Okay. So I'm on CosmoQuest. Do science. Click Moon Mappers. And Simply Craters. This is much better. Now I have a mouse. Okay. So again, I've got the Mark Craters chosen. Uh, first time you come, if you haven't been here before, we'll ask you to sign up with the username. That helps you keep track of your stats, and that makes sure uh, we keep track of all the markings you've made. So what I do is I click in the center of a crater, hold down the button, and drag out this circle. And you want to get the edge of that circle to the rim of the crater. Now this is the part where you can introduce a little bit of human error um, in who, you know, where the rim of the crater is or isn't if it's not completely sharp. Um, you want to make sure it's a certain size crater, right? So if you can see this little circle starts off red when it's small and then it turns green. Anything that you stop at when it's still red, it's too small. We don't want anything smaller than this green circle over here. Hope you can see that. Um, so yeah, you go along and you mark all the craters you can see. You have a little sun icon that tells you where the sun is in that image, and so you know it's lighting up this side of the crater, and there's shadow on the other side. Looks like there's another crater here. Um, if you make a mistake, you can always go to delete marking and get rid of it. Go back to mark craters. This one, of course, has a lot of craters, so I'm going to be sitting here doing this for a little while. The um, slightly addictive thing about using the mappers tools on CosmoQuest is when you hit done working to submit your image, it pops up with a new image <laughs> pretty much immediately. Uh, and so if you say, okay, I'm just going to do one more, and then the next image comes up and you go, oh, that's kind of interesting. I like that picture. Um, you may find yourself doing this for quite a while. So uh, marking craters, marking craters. Um, <clears throat> this one is kind of degraded, but those we really want as well. Uh, those help uh, Stuart and Irene, the scientists, figure out things about the age of the surface. The more eroded craters are ones that have been around for much longer. Um, some of it just looks ripply to me. Uh, Yeah, so we're just showing, the, I'm showing, I'm screen sharing the, the page, which is why you can't see me. <laughs> uh, and, okay, I'm going to try and get a few more. Oh, and uh, just getting a message that they are ready to go live. So I am going to uh, unscreen share. <laughs> 